gift. I got the batteries on this thing. Amen. Can you all hear me? Can you hear me now? Is that what one of them fellers said? Can you hear me now? Amen. How many is enjoying and loving God? Amen. I'm so thankful for the Lord and for all He means to me. And I'll tell you, living in the days that we're living in, how many knows it's good to know you know Him and more than more than that, He knows you. And especially what's going on in our world today. And uh, we're in Revelation chapter 19. We didn't get through all through this chapter. And again, we're trying to move through. we got a few more chapters of study in the book of Revelation. And um, we're wanting to get into the 39 foundational principles. Once we get through this, we'll preach and teach through our foundations of the Word of God. How many of you can't build a good house if you ain't got a good strong foundation in it? And uh, it's more important to do more than just hear the Word of God. you got to be a doer of it, don't you? And uh, if, it, if it works. And so uh, I believe a man needs to know what the Word of God says. Brother John. Revelation chapter 19, look with me in verse 9. We, we, last week we moved down through, and I pray when you left out of here you had something to think about. Uh, Revelation 19 through 20 and 21 and 22 has a lot to say about doctrine and about what's going to happen, especially when you start moving over to the thousand year reign that we're about to see. When you heard me last week, I said chapter 19 has two suppers in it. It's got the marriage supper of the Lamb, and then it's got the great supper of God that we're going to read about here just in a moment. And I said, you're either going to go to supper or you're going to be supper. And it's, and it's really up to you. And you may scratch your head and say, well, I don't know. Well, let me show it to you as you read down through the Word of God. And I'll show you what's on. The, it's called the Great Supper of God. And it talks about what's on that menu and everything. And uh, I want to make sure I'm going to supper. I don't want to be supper. Can you say amen? Revelation 19 and 9. Look with me and see what the Bible says. The Bible said, and he said unto me, right, blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said unto me, these are the true sayings of God. And I fell at his feet to worship him. And he said unto me, See thou do it not. I am thy fellow servant and of thy brethren that have the testimony of Jesus. And then he says, Worship God. For the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. And I saw heaven open and said, be, and, and, and behold, a white horse. And he that sat on him was called faithful and true. And in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he, he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which are, were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, and out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. And he treadeth the winepress, notice this now, of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. I'll stop right there. Let's pray here. Father, we're thankful tonight for all that you mean to us. Lord, we're grateful for the Word of God that you give us, Lord God, to read and to understand these things that's about to come to pass. And Lord, we know that you died for us, Lord Jesus, and shed your blood, and we just pray that Lord, that you just help us to be ready, Father, against this day. Well, I want to be ready more than anything. I want to be faithful to what you give us to do. Bless our church. Bless everyone that we come in contact with. Help us to be a help to them. In Jesus' name we pray and everybody said amen and amen. When we get to Revelation 19, you know, we're getting into what we're going to see a lot of, the judgment of God, and especially people, have you heard me say many down through the years, they'll say, well, if God's a God of love, then why would he send anybody to hell? But what you got to realize is God don't send anybody to hell. In fact, it was the love of God that sent his own son here to die on a cruel cross for our sins so that through faith in him, uh, that through his death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, we would be spared from that, uh, from that horrible place called hell. Everything that God does, whether it's in judgment, chastisement, or what it's always in an intent or a motivation because of love. And I know it's hard for people to see that. And I tried to explain that last week sometimes that when you talk about the judgment of God and you start seeing some of the things in the old Bible that begin to take place, you think, well, if God's a God of love, why 
does he allow these things to happen? Well, it, it's simply because that he might uh, spare the rest of the of the of the people of God. Now we're going to move into Revelation 19. And we're going to see a lot of the judgment of God right here. It'll cause people to scratch their head just a little bit. But this is going to happen just as sure as I'm standing right here before you. And uh, let's look and see what it says. In Revelation chapter 19 verse 9, the Bible said, He said unto me, Right, blessed are they. Now I want you to notice real close which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he saith unto me, These are the true sayings of God. Now, sometimes there's been a lot of confusion concerning uh, what's going on here about the notion of the marriage supper of the Lamb. But I want you to notice that what he says, notice what the guests are called to. They're called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. This isn't referring to the marriage ceremony, but the marriage supper. How many knows the church is the bride of Christ? In fact, the Bible says that Apostle Paul espoused us as a chaste virgin unto one Bride or under one uh, man, which is our Savior Jesus Christ, and so the church is the bride. How many know the bride never needs to be called to her own reception because we're there? But when you talk about the marriage supper of the Lamb, you're talking about the reception, and it's talking about the guests who are going to be called to the marriage supper uh, of the Lamb, and who are usually invited to the reception? It's friends. It's family and, and folks like that. I can remember me and Sharon got married. We was down there at Pine Hill. What a beautiful ceremony that it was. But how many knows usually the bride and the groom, they take pictures apart. They got groom. The bride takes pictures first. And then after the ceremony, then the, then the bride and the groom come together and they take their pictures. Well, we had a big meal downstairs prepared. And I thought it was always been funny. Because we, as we were taking pictures, everybody went downstairs to eat. By the time we got down there, there was nothing left. It was all gone. I had to eat a bologna sandwich. And uh, when we went on our honeymoon, we got down to Gatlinburg. And we found a little side, a little barbecue place by the road. We were starved to death, got in the, got in the car show line. And, but I've always said from now on, every wedding I go to, I'm going to eat everything they've got. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pay them back. But we was invited, that was invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. So these that are called to the supper are Old Testament saints and maybe tribulation saints that have been saved out of the seven years of tribulation. Notice what the apostle, what John the Baptist said. He, he made this statement. He said, Ye yourselves bear me witness that I said I am not the Christ, but that I am sent before him. And he that hath the bride is the bridegroom, but the friend of the bridegroom which standeth and heareth him rejoiceth greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. This my joy therefore is fulfilled. And he said this in St. John 3, 28 and 29. John the Baptist, the last of the Old Testament prophets, identified himself as a friend of the bridegroom. Only New Testament Christians that make up the church are going to be with the bride. No other saints will have part in that glorious privilege of being the bride of Christ. But however, every God, every one of God's people, all of God's uh, children will be present at this particular supper. But those that are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb is not going to be the bride because they've never been a bride in history that's been invited to her own reception. Right? And so the Bible talks about, and you've heard me say this last week when the Bible said in Corinthians, I have not seen, ear hath not heard, neither has it entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for them that love him. And most people stop right there, but the next verse said, But God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit. So the people of God has something of somewhat that they can look forward to. You know, we have, we have the uh, Word of God. Now notice in verse 10 what John does. He said, and I fell at his feet to worship him. And he said to me, see thou do it not. I am thy fellow servant and of thy brethren and have the testimony of Jesus, colon. But then he says, worship God. For the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. This overwhelming, glorious message that John got from an angel or whoever it was that was, was bringing him this revelation, John falls down at this heavenly person, begins to worship him, and this, this man stands him up and says, don't worship me. 
How many of those angels is never meant to be worshipped? Angels are seen standing around the throne. We see seraphims flying around the throne, but Jesus is seated in the throne. The angels, as great as they are, and, and, and you all heard me, I, I just ended last night my study on angels, and I've realized that the angels of God is more than just, just a mystic or mysterious being, but all through the Word of God, they're active when it comes to God's people. In fact, how many of those angels are going to be present probably with us when we make our crossing from this life to that life? In the book of Luke, when the rich man died, the Bible said that the rich man died and lifted up his eyes in hell and was in torment. But when the beggar died, the Bible said the angels of heaven came and bore him to the bosom of Abraham. Elijah, when he went to heaven, guess what happened? He looked up, Elisha was with him, and he says, My father, my father, the chariots of God. And here they come, the angels of heaven came and swooped him up and took him to the, to the kingdom of heaven. When Jesus ascended to heaven, the clouds carried him away. But there were angels present there that day when they were standing there watching him go to heaven. The Bible said, why do you men of Galilee stand here gazing to heaven? For this same Jesus that you see go away shall come in the same like manner as you see him go. So angels, even in this service, I by faith believe that angels are gathered out here with us. Every single person. That's with us. And I can go through the book. I can prove to you the, the, uh, the, 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 the work that angels do. And I believe that at the, if we don't go by the rapture uh, at, our, at our time, the crossing from this world to that world, if you're going to heaven, angels will stand present with us to carry us over to the land of heaven. In fact, about, uh, about a week and a half ago, I had a dream. And I mean, I'll just tell a dream as a dream. But, uh, but it meant something to me. I saw a man fall over. He, he was dead. And in this dream, I stood looking, and two angels appeared with this man. It was like they bent right down, and one angel laid his head right on his chest, and the other one scooped his feet up and lifted him right up out of his body. His body was still laying there, but this man's spirit was laying in the bosom of these angels as they began to carry him home. And I don't know if the Lord was just showing me or helping me to understand something, but it's one of the greatest dreams I've ever had. And so, the, as wonderful as they are, and you see angels all through the Word of God, never know where in the Bible are we commanded or even remotely said to worship an angel. Uh, you know, never. You know, you never bow down and you never worship angels. And any real angel of God will never accept any worship from man. I think that's why that we see when Jesus was in the book of Josh, or book of jo, or, uh, Judges, was it Judges? No, it was Joshua when he come with a sword and Joshua came and said, are you for us or are you against us? And it was the angel of the Lord. And many people believe that's the pre-incarnate Christ before he was, took on human form. And he said, no, I've come as the captain of the Lord's host. Joshua falls down and worships this angel. But the angel never told Joshua not to worship him. Because many people believe the angel of the Lord is the pre-incarnate Christ. And so here this angel that was giving him this revelation says, don't worship me. But he says, but worship, but worship God. For the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. And then when you jump down to verse 11, notice what it said here. Now, verse 11 said, I saw heaven open. Now what we're getting into here is the glorious return of Jesus Christ. And without a doubt, in almost every book, it's the high point, especially of the book of Revelation. In the very beginning of Revelation, chapter 1, verse 7, John says, Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him, and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so, amen. The second coming of Jesus has been one of the most prophesied and promised events all through the Word of God. And you ain't got to Look these up, but just to give you an idea of how many scriptures there are, there's scriptures like Deuteronomy 30 in, in, uh, in verse 3, Psalms chapter 2, verses 6 through 9, Isaiah chapter 40, verse 10, Ezekiel 21, verse 27, Daniel 7, verses 13 through 14, Joel chapter 3, uh, 1 and 2, and it just goes on and on and on. And many, and many times even Jesus himself spoke, of the rapture of the church and the second coming. So when we get to verse 11, we're now seeing the second coming of Jesus. Notice what he said. 
And I saw heaven open. Now stop right there and think about this. In the book of Revelations, there's only two doors that is seen opening. We see heaven open in the very beginning. I think it's Revelation chapter 4. The church is seen going through that door because chapter 4 and chapter 5 is seen in heaven and we are seen going through that door. Now, after seven years of tribulation, John says, I see, I saw heaven open. And now this door is opening up and now we're about to return with him. And notice what begins to take place. And behold, a white horse. And he that sat upon him was called faithful and true. And in righteousness, he, speaking of Christ, doth judge and make war. This rider on this white horse is Jesus Christ. In chapter 13, he was described as the Word of God. In chapter 16, he was said to be the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And here, now we're seeing the Bible said he's called faithful and true. And in righteousness, he doth judge and make war. The first time Jesus came, he came crucified. The next time he comes, he'll come to, honor, to, to conquer. The first time he came, he received a crown of thorns. The next time he comes, he's wearing, the Bible says, many crowns. No longer is it going to be the meek, mild, lowly Savior riding in on the back of a donkey. But he'll ride in all the splendor and the glory and come on now in the honor of heaven. And the authority of God the Father will be behind him when he appears the second time to return back to this world. It's a wonderful thing. And I want, I want to set your mind up and think about what's going on. When that door opens, I want you to think that from, from about Revelation 16, verse 10, the earth at that time had been engulfed in thick black darkness. But if you remember, the Bible said in Revelation 16 and 10, the fifth angel poured out his vial upon the seat of the beast and his kingdom was full of darkness, and they gnawed their tongues for pain. Even Joel the prophet in chapter 2, verse 2, said it this way, A day of darkness and of, and of gloominess, a day of clouds and of thick darkness. Imagine a scene where the whole world has been for months in thick darkness. No light is shining anywhere. And, and, the, and the seat of the beast that begin to be judged all down through that through those months. And all at once, they see a low glowing light beginning to appear in the, in the heavens somewhere. Can I tell you, you don't have to have a bright light to see in the darkest of times. How many has ever been out in a dark place? Uh, you know, we, you know, I didn't coon hunt much when I was growing up, but I've been out in them old dark woods at night. And you can just at a great distance, you can see a light a long way off if it's just got a, a low glow or just a small dim. And here we're going to see, we're seeing this door open and every eye is going to behold this light. And they're going to see something beginning to happen in the heavens. And it's, and so, and it's sort of sad because what's going to happen is, is when the people begin to realize what's going on, all hope of being saved is going to fade. For the wicked is going to realize for the first time that they have now passed their deadline of being saved and born again. Can I tell you, friends, what a tragic place that that would be in to realize that they have no more hope, no more chances of receiving Christ as Savior. They've had seven years knowing the church is gone, seeing all that's going on. I mean, I'm talking about we all, we, we, we've done went through it. We've seen the seven seals broken, cataclysmic, cosmic events is happening, fresh waters turned to blood, the seas are turned to blood. We see one third of the earth's population dead. The church is gone. Angels is flying through the heaven proclaiming the everlasting gospel of Jesus Christ. 144,000 Jews are going around the world as evangelists. They're trying to urge people to be saved and born again. Two witnesses is going to stand and proclaim the greatness of God and call fire right out of God from heaven and shut up the rain. And I mean, there's going to be awesome things begin to happen to prove that they're living in the last of the last days, but instead of returning to Jesus, they harden their heart and think everything's going to be right. This, the people are so wicked during this time. The only scene of happiness and joy and the exchanging of gifts is when the two prophets are killed and lay on the streets as dead. The people are going to be so happy because they're going to say, the, those two guys that tormented us is gone. I think that's what people think about holiness preaching sometimes. Said, Man, I'm glad he's out of that pulpit. He's tormenting us. 
But I'll tell you, friends, these guys are calling out for the truth. And it, listen, and if we don't make it that far, I'm going to tell you something. I would hate to think that I've had an opportunity my whole life to receive Jesus as Savior. And come down to the end of life and know I'm about to make the cross. And, and not feel. Listen, you can't just get saved, guys. Listen, anytime you want to. That is a lie. That's a myth. There's nothing true to that. You can't sow wild oats. And then when you decide you're ready, then whisper a prayer and get saved. It don't work like that. Jesus said, no man. How many knows no man means no man, woman, child, girl. No man can come to him except he that sent me draw him. You have to have the Holy Ghost heaven draw you. You have to have an invitation. You have to feel the urging. You have to feel that, that, that desire to pray. And wouldn't it be bad to come right down to the door of death and want to pray and can't pray and can't feel uh, d just the urge to repent? And it happens. Charles Whittemore, been, he's 90-something years old. I guess Daniel's been there 60 years. He told me only two times his life he's ever seen this. And I think I've shut it here numerous times because it, it made an impression on me. He said he saw a man in the hospital one time and he said that he was screaming with everything he had. Said his feet was going into the fire. Said they had to move his people right out of the right out of the hotel, right out of the hospital. Said he was literally pulling his hair out, handfuls of hair. He was pulling them out of his head in pain. And they were saying, and Charles said, I stood by that man's bedside and said, pray, buddy. Son, why can't you pray? And he was screaming with everything in him and said, I can't pray. I can't. I can't. He, he won't hear me no more. And slipped right out into a bad country called hell. Now, I'm telling you, folks, this, is, this ain't make-believe. I mean, this, this is real. Uh, uh, Mike Sandlin, remember Mike Sandlin, supervisor, told people, he may have told Daniel this. He said when he was lost, he said he went to a tent revival and said the first night he went in that tent revival, he fell under so much conviction. Oh, he felt the urge to pray. He felt like he needed to come. And he got up and said, no, I'm not going to come tonight. I'll, I'll pray tomorrow night, Lord. Said he came back that tent revival, felt nothing. Come back the next night, felt nothing. Four or five months went by. He kept going to church, kept going to church, asking God to deal with him, and nothing. Never felt a drawing. Never felt any conviction. Never felt a tear. Drier than cornbread. And all at once, six months later, sitting in the church service, he felt God call him one more time. He said, this time, brother, I didn't hold back. He said, I got up and run to that altar and give my heart to God because he had felt like the deadline had crossed over him. And this myth that says I'll get wild and sow my wild oats and live like I want to. And then when I get ready, no sir, no ma'am. No, when God gets ready for you, he'll call you. And it's up to you to respond and come when the Spirit of God calls you because you may not get that call. Oh, yeah. Scary. Brian Gabbard told me one time years ago, he said, there's a man, I've said it here before, this man was going to try to use God's plan to do what he wanted to do and kind of live in the flesh a little bit for one night. He said, oh, I'm going to go out and tie a big and I'm going to get drunk, but God said he'll forgive me. So he, in his mind, willfully premeditated an idea in his mind, I'm going to go out and get wild because tomorrow God will forgive me. He went out and tied one on all right. But Brian Gabbard said when he come back, that man, you'd find him on that altar bawling his eyes out, beating on that altar, saying, Lord, just give me one more chance. I ain't felt your spirit since that night. Beating on that altar. Beating on that. But I'm going to tell you something. Elliot said something in that jail last night I never heard nobody say. He said, you can't lie. There's three people you can't lie to. You can't lie to God. He knows you. You can't lie to the devil. He knows you. And you can't lie to yourself. You can lie to everybody else. But you can't lie to you. You know whether you're saved or whether you're not. You know whether you're living good for God or whether you're not. And when it comes time to die, if we don't go up in that rapture, when it comes time to die, children, you hear me. The only thing that's going to be on your mind 
is where do I stand with that God right over there? Because that's you can't buy heaven. I like what Elliot said. If you can buy, if you can buy your way to heaven, you know I couldn't win. I ain't got enough money to get myself to heaven. If it costs money and riches to get to glory, how many knows these poor people never make it? But Jesus died and shed his blood for every person who would give their heart and their life to him. They could be saved. And so these people are going to see this light out of thick darkness and just for a moment of time, they might rejoice but then realize the deadline is past. The Bible said in Hebrews 9 and 28, So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. He's riding a white horse. And keep in mind, the custom in ancient time was that when a Roman soldier came back victorious, he rode a white horse, oftentimes with the king of that nation, derobed, uncrowned, leading him through the street, parading him down, displaying, saying he has been stripped of all authority. Jesus, now, I don't believe all dogs go to heaven. I don't believe animals go to heaven. If you do, that's all right. But there are horses there, and they're all white, looks like, because he's riding on a white horse. And the Bible talks about how we're coming back on white horses, and we're not coming back to fight. We're coming back to observe, to watch Christ get the victory, because he's the one. That's going to do it. And I'm going to share it with you. Notice what it says in verse 12. His eyes were as a flame of fire. And on his head were many crowns. And he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. Remember in the book of Jude. Chapter. Or verses 14, 15. Listen to what he says. And Enoch also the seventh from Adam prophesied of these. Saying behold the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints. To execute judgment upon all. And to convince all that are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds which they have ungodly committed and of all their hard speeches which ungodly sinners have spoken against them. Notice the attributes of the Lord. First it says in verse 11 that He's faithful and true. That means Christ is absolutely reliable and trustworthy. If you remember in Revelation 6 two, there was a rider that came in on a white horse but he was an impersonator. He showed himself to the people to be a world deliverer but he was Satan himself. He was the Antichrist. This one is faithful and true. Number two, his eyes was a flame of fire. The eyes of the, the eyes of fire represents the Lord's penetrating gaze that searches every heart and every mind of man. If you remember, First Samuel says, "For the Lord don't see as a man sees; for man looks on the outward appearance, but God what looks upon the heart." His eyes will search in judgment, and I'm telling you, friends, there's no one, there's no no one person that will ever escape of the examination of his eyes. The Bible says the eyes of the Lord are in every place beholding the evil and the good in Proverbs 15 and 3. Everywhere we are, everything we do how many knows he's there? He's there. He knows the intent. He knows the motive. He knows our thoughts. He knows our words that's afar off. He knows it all. Are you getting this picture that we're serving a mighty God tonight? That he ain't somebody in a rocking chair knitting. That he's an almighty God. And that he is still a part of the affairs of men. The Bible said on his head were many crowns. The crown speaks of absolute rule and sovereignty. In the ancient world when a king would go and destroy another nation. They would literally take the king off of that. Or the, the crown off that king's head. And place it upon the conquering king's head. And you even see this in 2 Samuel 12 and 30. When David defeated the Ammonites, the Bible said he took their king's crown from off his head and the weight thereof was a talent of gold with precious stones and it was set on David's head and he brought forth the spoil of the city in great abundance. The fact that Jesus is seen wearing many crowns signifies that he's defeated all the kings and the nations of the world. In Revelation eleven fifteen, the Bible records and says the kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ. And he shall reign forever and ever. They ain't going to be a Democrat. Republican. Independent. Libertine. Listen, you're not going to vote this guy in. He's coming. I said he's coming. And he's coming with absolute power. And authority. Thank God. 
Can somebody say amen? I said, thank God. He's coming with great power and great glory. The Bible said he had a name written that no man knew but himself. And now, you know, there have been a lot of people tried to explain this, but I'm going to tell you something. I don't think there's any warrant to even try to speculate what that name means. John saw the name and couldn't even comprehend it. He had a name that no man knew but he himself. And, it, and the text is clear. The secrecy of the name there in that text. It lets us know that there's things about Jesus that we don't know yet. And that we, when, when we get to heaven, it may take an eternity of fellowship and loving him to really get to know everything about him. God, I, I can't sit here and say I'm a quantum physicist and all these kind of things. I don't know how big the universe is and how it's expanding and how many galaxies there are and billions of stars. All I know is that our God created it all. All I know is the psalmist says God is so big he calls every star by name. All I know that God is so big that the heavens is his throne and the earth is where he props his foot up. It's his footstool. All I know is our God is so big he holds the seas in the palm of his hand. I don't know everything about him and this book don't contain everything there is to know about God. This is what God through the Holy Ghost has chosen to reveal to us about himself. And it's enough. Can somebody say amen? But when we get there, oh, can I, oh, I, I just like, I, I, I'd love to stop here and preach just for a minute. I ain't going to, but let me share something. When Solomon, arrayed in all of his glory, there was Queen of Sheba come from so far away. She went, came 200 miles, and she came in with great pomp and great parade and when she got there, she asked him all these questions. Thought, and you know what she said? She said, everything I've heard is true. But then she said, but the half of it was not even told to me. I, the half has not even been told. We can hear a lot, but when we get over there, I believe we can say, you know what? The half of this place ain't even never been told. It's not even been told. We don't even know everything that's awaiting over there. All them beautiful angels, them chariot beams, them them seraphims and them, them whatever, whatever, just a street of solid gold is going to be amazing to me. To see them little children run around and nobody hungry and nobody sick. And, and Listen, the, the life of this body is the blood, but the life of the spiritual body is going to be the spirit. And it, I don't know what it would be like not to have any, any bad feeling. Does that, does that make sense? When we get over there, we will never know what lust feels like. We'll never know what jealousy is. All we'll know is one thing, and that's pure, unadulterated love because God is flowing through all of us. And I don't know exactly how that would feel, never to have any of them old feelings ever again. We can't even imagine, can you? I, I've asked God one time, I said, Lord, I'd like to love just like you love just one day. I'd like to know. I, I mean... I've got God's love, but how many knows if you ain't careful, somebody cuts you off in the in the traffic. I mean, you ain't gonna say nothing bad, but you'll get hot. Like, what do you think you're doing, Bob? Or somebody will mistreat you and you get upset. Or you're carrying around hurt feelings. Or I mean, guys, this I mean, I don't even know what that would feel like, but I'd like to love like God. I mean, really, really, one day if I could stand it, I'd like to know just how God really loves. You think he loves the murderers. He loves the drunkards. He loves rapists. I'm going to get real. He, he even loves pedophiles. For me, I think they all go to jail. But he loves everybody. With a good, with a pure love. And it's hard to fathom the fact of a love like that. But when we get over there, I'm convinced that I'll love like that. I won't be an angel, but Jesus said, we shall be as the angels in heaven. Oh, but I tell you, that's exciting. The Bible said in his name, it's called in verse 13, the Word of God. In St. John, the Bible said in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God, and the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. The glory as the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. 
The Bible also says that on his vesture and on his thigh a name written King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And you'll remember the first time he come, they mistreated him, they abused him, they hung him on a cross, put thorns on his head, and in, a, and in mockery they hung a sign over his head, This is Jesus, King of the Jews. But one of these days when he returns, he'll not be in mockery. He'll be wearing that name on his thigh and it shall read King of Kings and Lord of Lords and he will have the final say so. You think about that. He goes on to say, I mean, you just think about what's going on. Now look at verse 13. And he is clothed with a vesture dipped in blood and his name is called the Word of God. Now this is where it gets kind of, uh, you know, this isn't the blood that saves us. This is the blood of his enemies. And you might want to read this in Isaiah chapter 63, 1 through 4. Listen to what he says. Who is this that cometh from Edom with dyed garments from Baza? This that is glorious in apparel, traveling in the greatness of his strength. I speak in righteousness, mighty to save. Wherefore art thou red in thine apparel, and thy garments like him that treadeth the wine fat? I have trodden the wine press alone, and of the people there was none with me, for I will tread them. I will tread them in mine anger and trample them in my fury and their blood shall be sprinkled upon my garments and I will stain all my raiment for the day of vengeance is, my, is in mine heart and the year of my redeemed is come. Literally, he's given an imagery of stomping grapes to get all the juice for wine that would stain the garments and the feet. But when the Bible says that his garment is stained red, he ain't talking about smashing grapes. He's talking about the day of his vengeance and the day of the battle of Armageddon when he comes, his garments it shall be stained red. Is this the meek mouth Jesus that everybody always talks about? He's mighty. Is it shocking to know that when he comes, he's going to judge the world? Guys, I mean, think about it. Listen to what he says here in verse 14. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, White and clean. The armies of the Lord include all the redeemed of the church age. All the Old Testament believers. All the tribulation saints. And the holy angels, according to Jude, will come back with him. And in fact, Isaiah 42, 13 said, The Lord shall go forth as a mighty man. He shall stir up jealousy like a man of war. And he shall cry, yea, roar. And he shall prevail against his enemies. Isaiah 42 and 13. Think about that. We're not coming back with him to fight. We're coming back with him to observe, to watch. Just like the angels of heaven in the book of Genesis. Am I boring you? In Genesis chapter 1, the Bible said, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. I believe that's the order in which God created everything. He first created the heavens and everything that was in them, then the earth. And Job tells us that when God began to lay the foundations of the world that the morning stars and the sons of God sang together which means the angels of heaven stood on the sideline and watched while God created the universe. When we come back with Him, we're not coming back to fight. We're just going to watch. We're going to observe. He's the one who will get the glory. Notice verse 15. And out of His mouth goeth a sharp sword that it that with it he should smite the nations and he shall rule them with the rod of iron. How many knows that the word of God is sharper than any and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing and dividing the sunder, the soul, the spirit, the joints, and marrow, and that he's the discerner of the thoughts and intent of the heart. He'll speak the word and his enemies will be gone. His word is irrefutable, irresistible, it's all-inclusive. We get a hint of his power, the word, and the garden of Gethsemane when they come to take it with Judas. They ask him, where is Jesus? And Jesus said this, as soon then as he had said unto them, I am he, they went backward and they fell to the ground. Just in him identifying who he was. All the people that come and take him fell down to the ground. What is the result going to be when he comes back from heaven to take vengeance? By the power of his word. In fact, the Bible said in Psalms 2.9, Thou shalt break them with a rod of iron. Thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. He's coming back like a great shepherd. And I just wrote this down. The shepherd's rod is made to conform, to correct, and comfort. Jesus in St. John 10 and 11 is called the good shepherd. In Hebrews 13 and 20, he's called the great shepherd. And 1 Peter 5 and 4, he's called the chief shepherd. 
and he stoned him. Ain't that good? Look at verse the last part of 15. And he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. Remember that imagery. He just said, and he, Jesus, treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. Now, if you'll remember, Revelations 14 and 20 talked about the, the, uh, the battle of Armageddon. We see in Revelation 19, 13, already clothed with a vesture dipped in blood. And we know that it's going to this great day, this war, is going to be in the valley of Megiddo. Revelation 16, 14 calls it the great day of God Almighty. Revelation 16, 16 says, And he gathered them together into a place called in the Hebrew tongue, Armageddon. And Armageddon means the mount of slaughter. That's what Armageddon means. And if you remember, it's 200 miles long. The armies will be 200 miles this way and 100 miles east and west. And they're gathered against the, the nation of Israel and God himself, Christ himself, shall come out. And if you'll remember, they said that the blood of men will be to the horses' bridles. Think about that. And run that deep for 200 miles. Now, I've been around horses all my life. And I've, listen, I've about grown up on one with my dad. Now, you got the standard size horse about 15 hands high. You take a big tall mule, you can go 17 hands high. So, I would say bridles, let's just say an average four foot is where a bridle would be. Now you think about blood that deep for 200 miles, guys. I mean, that's almost unthinkable, isn't it? Are they just seven pints of blood in the human body that's pumping through that little body of yours? Seven pints in everybody's blood, in everybody's body right here. But, but when he comes, the blood of men shall be so deep, it'll be to the horse's bridles for 200 miles. That's, that's, that's something to think about, isn't it? Notice what he goes on and says, Am I boring you to death? I hope I'm not. Look at verse 17. And I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried with a loud voice, saying, Under the fowls that fly in the midst of heaven, come and gather yourselves together. Here we go. Unto the supper of the great God. The marriage supper of the Lamb was for the saints of God, and now, after the battle of Armageddon, God is calling, this angel's calling, to the fowls that fly in the midst of heaven. Buzzards. Eagles. You know, eagles I didn't know was a... Was a a cleanup bird. They eat the junk off the road. Did you know that? We go to Wisconsin, me and Daniel, we'll go up there and shoot them them grouse and you'll see big bald eagles that eat dead deer that's down on the road. Now they're, they're about like a buzzard. I didn't know that. They eat dead stuff in, in the in the middle of, of the road. So you got eagles and buzzards and crows and possums and all these critters are coming out of their holes to the great supper of the great God. In fact, Zephaniah said, Hold thy peace at the presence of the Lord God, for the day of the Lord is at hand. For the Lord hath prepared a sacrifice, and he hath bid his guests. What's the sacrifice? It, notice verse 18. What's on the menu? You say, Pastor. Let's read it. Verse 18. That you may eat the flesh of who? Kings. The flesh of captains. The flesh of mighty men. The flesh of horses and of them that sit on them, and the flesh of all men, both free, bond, both small and great. That's what's on the menu. In fact, Ezekiel 39 said, basically, said that it takes seven years, I think, to cleanse the land. Joseph Sias wrote this, and I'm going to say this. I'm going I'm to quote him. The proud armies of the world imagine themselves to be invincible. However, they will become buzzard food. Under the mighty word of God. What a sad end to human life. There will not even be a funeral for them. No honor shall be given to them. There will be no pomp and no ceremony. There will be no burial. Simply said, Proverbs 29, 23 said, A man's pride shall bring him low. They're simply devoured and become food. Think about that. Revelations 19, 19 said it this way. And I'm not going to read just all of the verse right now. But it says, the first part of that verse will say, and I saw the beasts and the kings of the earth and the armies gathered together. Think about that. For what purpose to make war against him that sat on the horse and against his army? 
And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together for one purpose, to make war against him. I mean, it just shows you how depraved and how deep and dark the carnal heart can become. Listen to Zechariah 14, 1 through 4. I, am I, I mean, I hope I'm not giving you too many scriptures. But he said, Behold, the day of the Lord cometh, and thy spoil shall be divided in the midst of thee. For I will gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle, and the city shall be taken, and the house rifled, the women ravished, and half of the city shall go forth into captivity. The residue of the people shall not be cut off in the city. Then shall the Lord go forth and fight against those nations. That's when he fought in the day of battle. His feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east, and the Mount of Olives shall cleave in the midst thereof toward the east and toward the west. And there shall be a very great valley, and half of the mountain shall remove toward the north and half of it to the south. In Acts 1 and 11, the Bible said, the same, This same Jesus which is taken up from you into heaven shall come back in the same like manner. He, he left on Mount Olives. He's coming back. And when he sets his feet on that mountain, it's going to quake and that great mountain will divide in two. One part will go to the east. One part shall go to the west. In fact, even Joel says, Proclaim ye this among the Gentiles. Prepare war. Wake up the mighty men. Let all the men of war draw near. Let them come up. Beat your plowshares into swords, your pruning hooks into spears. Let the weak say, I'm strong. Assemble yourselves and come all ye heathen. And gather yourselves together round about. Thither cause the mighty ones to come down. O oh Lord, let the heathen be wakened and come up to the valley of Jehoshaphat. It's a calling. It's a clear description. that God is calling the people, the armies of the world to gather themselves together to the nation of Israel. And they're coming again for one reason, to make war against him, to sit on the horse and against his army. And I'm telling you guys, that spirit's in the world today. Trying to fight the church. Trying to fight morality. Psalms 2 says it this way. Why did the heathen rage? Now, now how, how's God going to respond to this? Psalms 2, 1 through 4. Why did the heathen rage and the people imagine the vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves. And the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointing. Saying, let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. So how's God going to respond? Listen. He that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall have them in derision. Puny man is going to shake his fist at an almighty God and make war with him. And the Bible says God will sit in the heavens and he'll laugh. And the word derision here in the Greek literally means, carries out the idea of laughing at in contempt. It means God will make these armies a laughing stock. Even having the notion that mortal man shall overthrow an almighty God. Now, he's good, folks. He saves us. He's made a way to heaven, but he's coming again, and he ain't coming meek and mild and lowly, sitting on a colt like he did the first time. He's coming as the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And I'm going to tell you something, friend. I'm going to be like John, and I'm going to say this. Oh, Lord, please come quickly. You know why? Because I'm ready. I looked forward to a day when there won't be no trouble. When I don't have to worry about facing death. I don't have to worry about anxieties. I don't have to worry about who's going to pay the bills. I look forward to a day, one big endless day when Christ himself will be the light of that city and I'll be there enjoying eternity with the angels of heaven. Never having to worry about nothing and I want to be in the front row when that big angel comes down with a big old chain and takes Satan by the hand and throws him in that pit. I'm like, hey, if nobody else rejoices, I'm going to dance on his grave. Can you say amen? And say, I'm glad he's gone. And it's going to happen because the Bible said it's going to happen. Verse 20, I'm almost done. And the beast was taken and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast and them that worshipped his image, these both were cast alive, look at there, into a lake of fire, burning with brimstone. The false prophet, look at there, they was all, they was smoked, they was taken up, cast into that lake of fire. 
Verse 21, I'm going to let you pray. And the remnant were slain with the sword of him that sat upon the horse, which sword proceedeth out of his mouth. And all the fowls, listen here now, were what? Filled. You know what that means? They went away full. With what? With their flesh. Ezekiel said, Ezekiel 39 and 12, Ezekiel 39, 9 through 10, said these dead, rotting corpses will be scattered all over the plain. And this is what he said, In seven months shall the house of Israel be burying them to cleanse the land. Ezekiel 39, 12, ready for yourself. It'll take seven years to clean the weapons. Ezekiel 39, 9 through 10. Jesus said it this way, Wheresoever the carcass is, there will the eagles be gathered together. He also said, and he said to them, Wheresoever the body is, thither will the eagles be gathered together. I tell you, it's going to be a scary time. And I don't, I want to go up in the first load. Can you say amen? And if you're saved and you're born again and you're holding right on, when that trumpet sounds, we're leaving out of here. We're going to leave the earth. We're going to take this one and finish up. But if you are left behind, if you're left behind and you're not ready, it's literally going to be hell on earth for seven years. So my question would be to all of us, why wait? Why wait? When you can be saved today, when you can be born again today, why why wait? Why put off doing tomorrow what God's trying to get you to do today? Well, I wonder. I mean, say, Brother Chris, I got some work to do. Anybody say that? I got work to do. I'm a work in progress. That means I'm a work in progress, Pastor. And if you, you know, I've always said this, this altar. It's one of the most important part of the services. Well, it's all important. The worship service, it, 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 it's all important. But right here is where we find our help. She's right on her knees. I've said it, and I'll say it till I leave here. Brother George Collins put it right in this, or he put it in me. He told me I had to pray to get saved, and I have to pray to stay that way, and I believe that. It's going to take a lot of prayer to keep yourself where you need to be, to stay planted, and it's going to be more than just bouncing in and bouncing out. It means getting down there. And, you know, we, we used to say, let's pray through. How many knows what praying through means? Pray through till you cry. Till you feel like you've touched heaven. If you'll do that, you'll leave feeling better than the way you come. Why don't we all stand this altar's open? Why don't we gather somewhere at our seats or wherever you feel comfortable and have a good season of prayer. Let God help you. I want to go to supper. I don't want to be supper. And it's your choice. And tonight I'm asking you, why don't you, why don't you make Jesus Lord, Lord of your life?